I'm Jereen Fleming, State Breastfeeding Coordinator with VDH. I'd like to welcome you all to the Fall WIC Designated Breastfeeding Expert Training. This webinar is produced by the Virginia Department of Health, Division of Community Nutrition, the WIC program, and is supported by the USDA Breastfeeding Peer Counselor Program. This institution is an equal opportunity provider. Thank you for joining us. I do have a quick few announcements before I welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Michelle Brenner. So uh, technical review, please use the question box to ask your questions. You're welcome to do that as she goes through her presentation. Um, you can provide us feedback there and let us know if you're having any technical difficulties. Uh, we are recording this presentation and it will be archived. A link will be sent out to all registered attendees and it will also be housed on the local agency corner. Adjust your volume settings at the bottom right corner on your computer as needed. And should you need assistance, please jot down Cedric's number here. Um, Cedric Boyle um, can help you. You can email him or call him if you have any technical difficulties. So today's presentation has been awarded to SERPs by IBLCE. This continuing education can be used to maintain your current certification. I hope that you all received information about the October 28th Maryland WIC conference. Uh, SERPs and CEUs will be available for that. If you are able to join live for any portion of the day, I encourage you to do that. Unfortunately, a recording will not be available. So if you can join or do something during your lunch break, um, that's awesome. The next opportunity for continuing education, however, um, will be recorded. So later today, I'll send you the link to register for the VCU Advances in Breastfeeding Strategies for Clinical Champions. That is taking place on November the 13th, and I realize this is likely too late for some of you to participate live. Uh, the good news is it will be recorded, available online, and today's webinar and the VCU Symposium are required DBE trainings for FY 2020, 2021, pardon, and should be loaded onto your train transcripts once completed. Speaking of continuing education, if you completed the April training and did not receive a certificate from me yesterday, please um, email me and uh, let me know that. At one time, each local agency had at least one pressure gauge. We, uh, you know, of course, we gave education about this at the April uh, webinar. So if you have looked around your clinic and don't see your pressure gauge, I would like you to go on and purchase another. It only costs about $55. And local breastfeeding funds may be used to purchase uh, the gauge. It, you should order it directly from the dealer um, because they will provide specific instructions um, for, for how to use it of course, for the inventory that, that we have in Virginia WIC. Make sure you involve your fiscal tech or your business manager. Occasionally, um, someone placed an order with Medela recently and the invoice came to the central office and we didn't know. So make sure that you um, have them identify your local agency um, for the purchase and to you know, ship the equipment to you. If you need more information about how to use the pressure gauge, I'll refer back to the April 9th, 2020 DBE webinar for more information. There are breastfeeding supplies available in the VIB warehouse. Uh, please complete the order form, which you can be found, which you can find on the local agency corner, and place your order with Catherine via email. We have an abundance of personal use pumps, and I'd really like to see them being used by our participants rather than sitting in the warehouse. Uh, the long-awaited breastfeeding peer counselor uh, documenta uh, documentation training should be completed this week and posted shortly, and I will certainly send you all out and, and, uh, a notification when that is ready uh, to share with your breastfeeding peer counselors. So I am delighted. It is my great pleasure to uh, Welcome and introduce you to Dr. Michelle Brenner, who is a fellow at the um, American Academy of Pediatrics and professor of pediatrics at Eastern Virginia Medical School, Children's Hospital of the King's Daughter. That's a mouthful. That's a mouthful, so we always just say CHKD. Uh, she is an attending physician at General Academic Pediatrics, the pediatric residency training program site at CHKD, and the medical director of the King's Daughters Milk Bank. 
She is a graduate of Purdue University, the University of Buffalo School of Medicine, and the Pediatric Residency Training Program at Children's Hospital of the King's Daughters. She has been an international board certified lactation consultant since 2002 and is an, a 2014 graduate of the Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine Fellowship Program. She recently developed a collaborative clinic with CHKD Pediatric Ear, Nose, and Throat to address concerns for tethered oral tissues and during COVID-19, a very successful telehealth breastfeeding medicine program. Thank you so much, Dr. Brenner, for joining us today. And again, participants, you are welcome to chat your questions as she does her presentation, and she has given me permission uh, to share those um, at relevant points. So, Dr. Brenner, please take it away. Okay, my microphone is on. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, so good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here today. Um, I'm sorry we don't all get to be in person. Um, I have lectured a bunch to our pediatric residents and medical students, and I find this really challenging because I really enjoy the opportunity to be in the room with everybody and field questions and gauge interest. So this is challenging. Um, I chose to work from home today. I had the choice. I could go to my office and not be able to control the noise around me or be home and potentially not be able to control the noise around me. So I do have a miniature schnauzer uh, who's right now napping, but as soon as the UPS or FedEx or Amazon truck drives down the street, you might get to hear from him. I hope not, um, but we will try to contain him if possible. So um, I wanted to thank Jereen for the opportunity to chat with you guys today. Um, Breastfeeding medicine has been part of my entire clinical career, just about. Um, as she mentioned, I was a lactation consultant since 2002. Um, my husband did an adolescent medicine fellowship at Baylor, and we moved to Houston. And um, I joined a practice that didn't really have any overflow patients for me. And I really didn't have a lot of breastfeeding training and residency, but for some reason, I well, I was um, seeing newborns at the Women's Hospital of Texas in Houston, and um, my routine at that point was to see babies 48 hours after discharge and that was pretty novel at that time most pediatricians were seeing babies at two weeks um, after delivery and so the lactation consultants labeled me a breastfeeding friendly pediatrician and i just kept getting more and more and more and i realized i didn't really know enough so i had joined the local um lactation consultants association and they encouraged me to study for the exam and take it and spend time with them and it it was a really great mentoring opportunity that I had. So um, you can be very powerful with other healthcare providers. Don't forget that. So um, breastfeeding medicine has been part of my entire career as a general pediatrician and in academics with the um, residents and medical students. And then recently um, with our tongue tie clinic as well as our telehealth program, it's just exploded. So this is an awesome opportunity today to talk to you about um, counseling breastfeeding moms who are supporting with or supplementing with formula and trying to work through some of the problems. Um, I do not have any disclosures today. Um, wanted to just uh, kind of review the objectives. And again, thanks to Jereen for not only naming this talk, but giving me the ideas of what you guys needed to know. And I'm happy to answer questions um, during, um, or I, I worked in two little small breaks where we can stand and stretch so we can certainly um, answer some stuff then too. So I really want to review some of the history taking skills that I use to evaluate a breastfeeding dyad because I feel like so much is in that history. Um, I want to briefly mention optimizing the early days of breastfeeding, which is likely review for everybody, identifying and troubleshooting latch issues specifically, um, recognizing and managing over and under supply. I deal with more oversupply than I ever imagined, um, and evaluating lip and tongue anatomy and talking about function because that's what's important when we're looking um, at what people are worried about being lip and tongue tie. So um, as Jereen mentioned this a year ago in October, after many years of attempting and failing to get administration to uh, recognize the importance of the issues about breastfeeding, a year ago October, our ear, nose, and throat uh, surgeons were persistent because they were getting 20 to 30 referrals per month for babies with concerns for lip and tongue tie. And they said, we, feel that people are, you know, families are being set up, they're being sent to us, they expect 
this lip and tongue to be clipped on the site and a miracle to occur. We are not comfortable watching breastfeeding moms to fix it. Um, we aren't comfortable with who's referring these to us. So will you work with us to do this? So the, we started Dr. Sri Raman, who you also may know because she's been pretty active in the breastfeeding community for Virginia. We started two half days a month in our ENT clinic. And um, that was challenging because two half days a month is not very often. And that left moms waiting sometimes two and three weeks to get evaluated for their concerns. Um, it was very difficult for the, the staff to phone triage what was important and who should we fit into these visits. It was very labor intensive, not only to get families not so much checked in, but honestly, like that eight o'clock appointment, people never were on time. So by the time, you know, the poor moms with the babies and they parked in the garage and they got to us, you know, it was often 8, 15, 8, 30 by the time we were in a room. And we, for our hospital, it was a very novel process. We started registering not just the baby, but the mom. We felt like both of them were our patients. We're dealing with both of their medical issues. We should be able to bill um, for both of them. And it was really important. So moms also needed some vital signs that, you know, we were getting temperatures and pulses and blood pressures um, and just managing expectations. Again, we found families were coming expecting this procedure today. They were nervous about this. Um, and then, um, you know, just the understanding that that alone isn't going to perhaps fix a lot of the situations that we ran into. So then COVID-19 happened and we've been doing pretty well. We did October through, I think, March pretty successfully. And then all of a sudden, actually, I don't think our March clinic. So then we realized um, we needed a telehealth option. And initially I kept being told, no, 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 we don't have staff to do this. And um, my husband is also a physician at our hospital. And his manager was about to furlough some folks in our therapy department. And so we happened to steal a couple people that just started scheduling telehealth patients for us. The good thing was they scheduled them, they checked them in, and that's all they did. So for most of our families, um, it provided this incredible availability. So I was doing it at least once, if not twice a week, um, as was Dr. Sri Raman. So we went from once or twice a month to once or twice a week. What was amazing to me was that if it was an eight o'clock or a nine o'clock patient, we were on the we were on the video by eight eight o five. It worked amazing. Um, we it was much easier to tell families, you know, try to make sure your babies are hungry because, and we were very clear about during this. Uh, virtual visit. We are going to talk about, you know, all of the issues. We're going to examine your baby's mouth and we're going to want to watch you breastfeed. So you need to know and be comfortable about that. We're, we used Zoom like a waiting room. So it was a secure platform. Um, and most moms were amazingly comfortable. Um, I, I didn't have anybody who was uncomfortable with this situation. It was a huge success. Um, or it continues to be a huge success. Sometimes it is very challenging to see the lip and tongue evaluations, but I'm gonna talk about why that might actually be a gift. Um, and the things that I learned from this are, most families have honestly multiple issues that are impeding this breastfeeding relationship. And the biggest problem is usually not the tongue and it's definitely not the lip. So um, we have fixed many, many families and been thrilled with the outcome of telehealth. Um, so, wanted to just walk you through how I kind of look at a family with a breastfeeding problem because I know often the families that are referred to you have already perhaps been seen by a few people, um, maybe their pediatricians, maybe your um, breastfeeding peer counselors. So recognizing that most breastfeeding difficulties are multifactorial and it's not just the baby. And as you know, it is very commonly the mom. Um, so guiding the story, um, I think often for me, I do need to start with any pre-pregnancy health issues with mom, asking about any chronic diseases she might have, asking about, or actually on telehealth, observing just if body habit is, is part of the issue. Asking about any prenatal health issues or pregnancy complications, um, you know, oligohydramnios, IUGR, um, anything that was during the pregnancy, any abnormal ultrasounds for the baby, any prenatal concerns for the infant. So again, abnormal ultrasounds for the baby, um, 
slow growth, what have you, what were they worried about during the pregnancy? And then I often forget this question and I often have to come back to it and I need to probably be better about asking it up front when I'm worried about um, undersupply. But so important, if you are hearing a story of undersupply or it sounds like mom's milk never came in, going all the way back and asking, do you remember during when you first realized you were pregnant, were there breast changes that you noted? For the most part, breasts should grow about a cup size in pregnancy, another cup size after delivery. And a mom I saw recently, just, uh, I have two in my memory. One was a long time ago and one was recent. And she was like, nope, nope, they didn't grow at all. Nope. And I said, after delivery, did you really notice any changes? Nope, they look just the same as they did before. And I was like, oh, okay. And um, it wasn't until we started feeding the baby that I realized, wow, this mom likely has insufficient glandular tissue. And that is why the, the volume is not increasing. That is why she didn't see any breast changes. Um, the other one in my past memory was a mom I saw in clinic, baby looked great, latched at the breast beautifully, wasn't growing. And I kind of went back to the beginning and I was like, gosh, I don't understand this. Like, did you have any breast changes in pregnancy? And she, you know, looked at me and looked at her mom and she was like, nope. And I said, did you have breast changes since delivery? And she, no, not really. And she giggled and she looked at her mom again and she said, the only time I had breast changes was after I got my implant. And so um, it wasn't the pro the implants weren't the problem. The problem was she had insufficient glandular tissue, which led to the implants. And then, um, so likely uh, the problem was pre-existing and just, I couldn't see any scars. And so I, I really need to be better about asking those questions perhaps. This um, next slide is the format that I have made to organize my brain. Um, as a general pediatrician, I am used to walking Every room we joke is like a box of chocolate. Like we don't know what we're gonna get. We usually, I'm obviously, you know, when you pick up the chart, but one room is a sore throat. The next room is a newborn. The next room is a teenager. The next room is a preterm baby. And I generally have no problem jotting down a couple notes. And if I'm super busy writing my notes at the end of the morning. When I do this in breastfeeding medicine, I am a disaster because just about every mom and baby has a very similar story. And if I don't write things down, I cannot write notes at the end of the morning. <laughs> so I had to come up with something that would keep my, my brain together. So I'm um, just walking through it quickly and we're gonna walk through um, everything in detail. So I'm not gonna go through it much, but um, obviously I'm super interested in how old the baby is today, what their gestational age was. I'm super interested if this was a late preterm baby because just notoriously preterm babies are poopy feeders. They might look great and be big and look coordinated, but they do not transfer milk well. Um, I think often we have unrealistic expect expectations for our preterm babies as well. Um, and so just knowing that up front, I wanna know what that is. Um, a little bit about birth history, um, a little bit about um, any, if anything went on in the nursery. And then ideally, I like specific information about birth weight, discharge weight, and any weight since then. It's a little bit of a downer that I don't get a weight for today if I'm doing this by telehealth. If I, we're now seeing them back in the office twice a month. So um, that I literally will go down to the day and I will look at today's weight and I will look at the last available weight and I will subtract it and divide it by the number of days and say your lady has gained 45 grams a day. Like my expectation is 15 to 30 and your baby's gained a 45 and you guys are a rock stars. So let's A, be grateful Not we're not worried about weight gain. Um, I want to know from mom a little bit about, um, you know, just, uh, how many babies she's had before? Has she had any breastfeeding experience in the past? Any pregnancy labor delivery issues, particularly um, hypertension issues, issues with edema, preeclampsia. Um, and I put that little breast surgery in there because again, I got fooled recently. I was probably 20, 25 minutes into a visit with a baby who wasn't gaining weight well. Um, baby was spending an inordinate amount of time with the breast, was, you know, they hadn't been hearing swallows. And I went back to my beginning and I was like, so tell me about, I don't even know how it came up. Have you, I think I was going through past medical history and I just asked, um, 
I asked about, I don't even remember. And she was like, oh, I've had three breast surgeries. I had a major reduction and then I had implants done and then I had a revision. And she said, you know, she had reviewed all of her records and they convinced her that, you know, she wasn't going to have a problem with, all, you know, milk volume. And so we kind of went on to, you know, were your areola, you know, were they removed during the surgery and then sewn back on? And yes, yes. And so I was like, wow, like we need to be grateful. Milk is coming that you have milk, that it, you know, all of those ducts have reconnected, but maybe that's why you're not feeling let down, that stimulation isn't working to increase your supply. And this was like, the parents were super shocked that, and no one had mentioned that this might impact this relationship. And so I was not very worried about the tongue at that point and had to back up. But anyway, medicines, allergies. And so because we are uh, creating a chart for mom, we can prescribe for them. Um, nipple creams and all kinds of stuff. So uh, just knowing all the medications and allergies and illnesses and et cetera. Um, I'm going to not go through the rest in detail because we're going to talk about it. But you can see just the, the little prompts to remind myself what things to ask and then the Hazel Baker score, which we're going to talk about close to the end about evaluating tongues. So I think I already went through a lot of this th these things, history, details of the late pregnancy. Um, very important to me, I mentioned, is swelling. If moms have edema, for, you know, I'll always ask, how swollen were your ankles? How swollen were your feet, your face? So not all fluid in the breast is going to be breast milk. It could be edema from all of the IV fluids that she received. And so that impedes milk flow out of the breast. And we'll talk also briefly in a bit about um, therapeutic breast massage to help remove some of the edema and move some of the fluid out towards the axilla where the lymphatics are. Um, I wanna know if she had any other issues that are currently you know, affecting her health because that's gonna affect when her milk is abundant. Um, those induced vaginal deliveries, again, sometimes can get a longer duration of IV fluid, might lead to that edema, the C-sections as well. Any other complications, vacuum, forceps, baby was stuck, had to have an emergency section. And then, as I mentioned, things from the nursery, birth weight, discharge weight, what did the loss look like, the percent loss? So doing that math, you know, the discharge weight divided by the birth weight. So there's a couple tools that you can use to kind of estimate when you should be concerned based on hours of life and method of delivery. I would say in my head, I just use, you know, if they're approaching seven to 8% loss, my eyes are open and I'm very aware of like, we need to follow this baby closely and they need to come back tomorrow. Um, if they're approaching 10 to 12% loss, my eyes are great big. And, you know, we're really talking about um, supplementation with either express breast milk or formula or something. If they're beyond that, we really need to make some great strides and, um, you know, it depends on the situation and where the milk is. But also chatting about bilirubin phototherapy, what the glucoses were, did they have any difficulty maintaining their temperature in the nursery? Um, moving on to the just the start of breastfeeding history, I'm always curious if parents obviously have breastfed before. Did they take a class? How you know who are their breastfeeding supporters, and what went on in the hospital? When was that first opportunity that they had to breastfeed, and who potentially may have helped? Did lactation stop in? Did you know the nurses help them? Um, and then trying to get an estimate of when did milk arrive. So it's usually abundant, as you know, by day three. Um, or at least coming in by day three, abundant by day four. Once milk is plentiful and increasing in supply, weight loss should end. Um, we should see more voids. We should see more stools. Um, my guide is four poops by day four, bigger than the size of a quarter. And timing for voiding is, you know, at least a void per day of life. So if it's day three, I hope you saw three peas today. Um, and then just finding out was there any supplementation that went on in the hospitals? And now that, again, what happened now that they're at home? What are, what's going on? Um, with the whole lip and tongue tie situation, that's, I feel like, just been this rampant conversation. Um, I am finding many babies who are labeled in the newborn nursery, either by the pediatrician or by one of the labor and delivery staff. 
Um, and I feel that's a little unfair that like this, this visual anatomic thing is being identified and brought to the family's attention before breastfeeding has even had a chance to get established that there's this concern that there's already maybe something wrong with the baby. Um, so I don't know what we're gonna do with that down the road. But. So most importantly, with most of the families I talk to, and they can be a variety. I, I've you know seen very young, obviously in the office, I see very young babies in my own practice who are you know three, four, five days old. Um, I see you know babies who are 10, 11, 12 days old because they come back in for their almost two week visit, and then on telehealth or in the office for ENT, they might be weeks, perhaps to months old. And so really drilling down for the family, what exactly do they want to happen? Um, I recently had a family who, this was baby number three, she had successfully breastfed the first two. Um, it was a concern for lip or tongue tie, I think it was tongue tie. Um, and at this point she was almost exclusively feeding formula by bottle. And you know, she really, like she kept saying, what I really want to happen is I really just want to breastfeed my baby. And he was already three weeks old and she hadn't been doing any pumping. And so, and she kind of said, I think I probably need to get motivated to start pumping. And I'm like, so if that's really what you want to happen, you really need to start getting motivated to pump like today, because her supply had already dwindled to the point that even if we got him to the breast, he wasn't staying engaged and interested. And so, um, you know, realistically looking about, looking at where they want to be and, and what's going to work. Um, sometimes that has to happen by looking at how much they're supplementing. And sometimes that's my, that's the clue that there's not a lot of milk transfer happening. If the baby's spending 30 to 45 minutes on the breast, and then they're supplementing this relatively small, less than 12 day old or something with two ounces of formula, you can pretty much guarantee that the baby's not transferring much milk and that's why they're taking that much in supplementation. Um, I always try to work with establishing what is achievable by maintaining sanity. Um, I feel like sometimes moms are so focused on getting breastfeeding to work that they're not enjoying their baby. And when I, when I've come to the realization that breast milk supply has already been compromised, I'm encouraging that we can make it grow, but I also want them to realize that enjoying their baby and taking that time um, and not just always focusing on the pump and the milk removal is so important and maybe we need to readdress our priorities. And obviously number one priority is feed the baby. However that is, um, I think formula is a necessary, and I, I don't know if I should say necessary evil, it's a necessary thing because our main goal is to feed the baby, help them grow and thrive, which may, which will ultimately help breastfeeding, keep them out of the hospital and move things forward. Um, as you all know, <laughs> I'm sure, getting a feeding history can be challenging. Um, and I always joke that getting to good clean answers, the residents hate this because they go in and they get a history and then they come back in with us and we ask the questions a little bit differently and we get a different story, which I'm sure you're familiar with. But in general, I'm interested in how much time are they spending with a breastfeed? Is that one breast? Is that both breasts? How do, what triggers them to switch breasts if they do? How much time is spent in latching? How much fussing? How much discomfort? How much pain? Are they seeing good rhythmic attachment and sucking? Are they noticing a change in cadence or speed between when a baby's actually feeding and drinking, where that cadence is nice and slow and they've got, they've got a swallow in there? Or is it just that non-nutritive fast suck attempting to get milk to let down pacifying suck? So um, sometimes when you point that out to families, they do realize there's a difference, but prior to that, they hadn't. Are they hearing swallows? And again, going back to after how much time at the breast, how are they, you know, are they also supplementing? How does that go? Does the baby immediately latch onto the bottle? Do they latch onto the bottle beautifully? Is that also a challenge? Um, and then again, estimating how much milk transfer is going from the breast to the baby. Does mom feel a letdown? Does she hear the baby? 
you know, gulp, gulp, gulp to try to keep up. Is she seeing milk? If the baby detaches, is she seeing it spray? Um, and then again, how much supplement will they take after feeding if they are supplementing and just gauging that to be like, wow, if this baby's this number of days old, I don't expect him to take two ounces at a feed. He's taking two ounces after the breastfeed. He's probably not transferring a lot. And then with all of this, just providing obviously lots of encouragement and praise through the whole thing that mom is doing an amazing job. The next step is asking about pumping. And I always struggle with asking this question because when I ask, are you, pump I always have to feel like I have to preface it that like pumping isn't necessary, but are you pumping? Because if I ask, are you pumping? Moms are like, oh, I'm not pumping yet or I'm not pumping enough. And so um, I just wanna put that plug out there that pumping is obviously not essential or necessary to a good breastfeeding relationship if it is going well. Um, and certainly can be detrimental if we are overgrowing supply. But pumping is crucial if milk transfer by the infant is inadequate, whether moms and babies are separated, mom is in the NICU or baby's in the NICU, mom is at home and traveling back and forth to see her baby, or if milk transfer by the infant is just baby's not just moving milk well, we are never going to grow the supply to where we need to. So asking about does she have a pump, what kind of pump? Obviously a double electric pump is ideal, but also not essential. Many moms do very well with a um, hand pump. Uh, many moms do very well with hand expression. Um, some moms prefer those methods over an electric pump. So, and then just when you get into the pump details, asking about how it's going. And I'm always amazed at the moms who just hate their pump. And usually those are moms that already have a pretty low supply that they're pretty frustrated with their pump um, because they think it should be working better. And those moms are likely to crank up the suction, cause themselves damage, um, and et cetera. So just reviewing, as you all know, this is not something families, I think, intuitively know that efficient and effective milk removal is key to growing and maintaining that supply. And if you only pump twice a day, your body thinks you only have a baby who feeds twice a day and that that other milk for those other six to eight feedings must be coming from elsewhere. The analogy I use for moms when I'm trying to encourage them to grow their supply I'll often ask if they have a sister and, you know, I kind of pretend like pretend your sister just had a baby too and she has to go have her appendix out. And she says, you are breastfeeding your baby. I have to go have my appendix out here. Here's my baby. Have at it. Breastfeed our two babies. Um, and, you know, I'll say today's Tuesday by Friday, you would have an abundant milk supply to feed both babies. And that's exactly the message your body needs to get. So that's what your pump needs to do today. If things don't go smoothly, as often I'm imagining if the families are in your office, that is the case. Um, obviously, again, back to the rules, feeding the baby is of utmost importance. And that might be express breast milk if we have some. Ideally, I would encourage moms to uh, express them and begin that over formula if they can. Um, formula would be option number two and perhaps um, some donor milk. So I, I have a mom, mm, that's a long story, but I won't tell the whole thing. A baby who's failing to thrive, um, very complex social situation, um, had been seen by one of my partners numerous times, had been given formula, insisted to me when I saw them when he was out of town that the baby wouldn't drink formula from a bottle. Um, I bottle fed the baby in the office, he did great, but the following week, she just insisted that the, when she fed him formula from the bottle, we actually did a an SNS with a you know tubing and did some finger feeding, and he did great with that too. But she really said that when she fed him formula, he threw up. And um, so I have the benefit uh, as being the medical director of the milk bank. I called my milk bank director manager and I said, "Hey, I have a mom that you know with community benefits, I know is going to qualify. Can we get her some donor milk?" Um, we went from gaining three grams a day to 40 grams a day by providing donor milk. And I asked her the following week, what made the difference? And at that point she'd been feeding well, and I actually did a pre and post weight feed breastfeed in the office that day when they were doing poorly and he gained four ounces. So he was transferring milk well, but I think he was sleeping too long at night. Um, and 
she just said by using donor milk, it took some of the pressure off. She wasn't feeling like she had to pump as much as she had been, and she was just much more encouraged. So that was a really great experience. So donor milk for certain situations, particularly babies with medical need, um, it is certainly available in the state of Virginia, and we can talk about that later. But um, so for babies in Virginia that have a medical need, we can provide that for them, and it's um, covered by TRICARE, I will tell you that much. Um, so anyway, back to the rules. Protecting the breast milk supply, so just like the mom that really wanted to breastfeed her baby from the get-go, you know, it would have been best if she had been pumping and providing express breast milk to her baby while we were fixing his latch, because now we're stuck if her milk supply doesn't um, come back abundantly. And then protecting the option to breastfeed to me means keep something happening at the breast during your intervention period. That always means for me, making sure the baby is undressed down to their diaper, even if you're bottle feeding, um, and that the baby is skin to skin eat with mom or dad when they're bottle feeding, especially in the beginning. Um, I think if we fully, if we feed babies fully clothed and then we undress them to try to breastfeed them to kind of keep them awake and then they've never been in that before, I don't know. I don't know if it's real, but to me it seems to make more sense to kind of simulate the situation. And then also giving them the opportunity to breastfeed, maybe not allowing it to go on for 30 to 45 minutes if we know that it's not very productive, but giving them the opportunity. And I'm always encouraging that every day your baby is older, every, every ounce your baby is bigger, they're gonna have better stamina. And we might fix this by the end of this week or next week. The best example I have of that is actually friends of mine who have a baby with Down syndrome. They had a first child who was completely normal. Second baby was an unexpected because they hadn't done any prenatal testing because they weren't, they didn't really want to know. Um, second baby was diagnosed with Down syndrome in the newborn nursery. Because mom had breastfed successfully baby number one, she knew what it looked like. Baby number two, it took Dylan six weeks to transfer milk effectively. But Katie, his mom, was persistent at every day she put him to the breast numerous times a day and after that you know opportunity for 15 20 30 minutes she would go ahead and bottle feed him and she was going to a support group and every week they would weigh the baby pre and post feed weight and every week he would transfer five milliliters 10 milliliters 10 milliliters 20 milliliters and on week six after this really great opportunity he transferred two and a half ounces so um, i do think again growth strength, stamina, increase in tone, things will get better if everybody's patient and persistent. And that's really a lot of the advice I give to preemie babies and really talk about when was your due date? Well, now your baby's almost term. So maybe in the next week or two, things might get better. So moms really need to know, and I know you guys know this, I'm preaching to the choir. I, this is my speech for my pediatric residents most often. You they need to know that you think it's worth continuing, that you think they're doing an amazing job, they will succeed with the right help. Either you can help them or you know someone who can help them and hoping that they have support at home or helping them arrange support at home where it can be the hardest. So um, that is my two cents on that. Um, just quickly knowing um, how do you know it's enough? For the most part, a minimum of eight to 12 feeds per day. I Tell families eight feeds is going to every three hours, eight feeds is going to get you a baby that's probably about the same weight as next week. They're going to sustain, but they're not going to grow. So, certainly, um, every as you all recite probably regularly, yeah, every two, two and a half, three hours per feed, um, between feeds from the start of one to the start of the next, just really making sure that you're doing this on demand and then some and not allowing longer sleep stretches if they're not back to birth weight. If they're back to birth weight, I'll often say, you know, you can have one four to five hour stretch at night, maybe hopefully that's when they'll pick it, but the rest of the day still needs to be back to that every two to three hour um, time frame. Four poops by day four with clearing of meconium. We talked about you're in diapers number of days old, relaxed and content baby after feeding like this guy, not the fussy, grumpy, crabby babies that I often see who are really hungry. Normal growth in the breastfed infant who's doing well, as you know, is robust. I again look at that seven to eight percent loss as an infinite risk. Weight loss should end when milk um, is becoming 
when mature milk is coming in and much more abundant at day three to four, increase in milk supply should occur by that day three, weight gain goal of 20 to 30 grams per day, return to birth weight easily by two weeks of life. When that's not happening, we have to start talking about milk transfer. Eight to 12 feedings for 24 hours. We talked about that. Lots of skin to skin, making sure families aren't waiting for crying, spotting early hunger cues, um, stirring and sleep, sucking fist and starting to squirm are times when we want to do this. We don't want to wait till everybody's starving. Whoop. And then a late hunger cue of crying. Um, poop, we should see lots of meconium on day one. Each day gets lighter and less sticky. It should go from black to brown to green to fancy gold. We like to see those breast milk, mustard, custard, yellow, seedy, loose poops. Four poops by day four, bigger than the size of a quarter. If I'm not seeing this, I'm concerned, and we're going to start talking about, you know, making sure, did your baby poop in the nursery? Are you sure, like, you saw it? Because I feel better if they see it, because maybe it got recorded on their chart, but they didn't poop. And, you know, we seldom see Hirschsprungs, but, um, which is a problem with the lower distal aspect of the colon and rectum and the nervous innervation and those babies often don't poop in the nursery and that's concerning so we want to make sure that someone has seen stool um, and that it's increasing oh and there it is bigger than the size of a quarter just to give people like i want to see substantial not just a small squirt um, this poor guy got it down the front of him <laughs> um, and just remember that there's a lot of stool in the first four to six weeks often four to six poops a day, breastfed babies poop a lot. I can honestly say I have never seen a firm stool come out of an exclusively breastfed baby. Um, if they are not stooling in those early weeks, um, lack of sufficient milk intake is typically the problem and you really need to look at milk transfer. This being said, remembering that as babies approach two months of life, the exclusive breastfed baby will I pretty much not always skip a day here and there, but it becomes so common that I start talking about it early with families. If they come in for a one month visit, I'll tell them, okay, before I see you next, I know your baby's pooping six times a day, but do not freak out if they don't poop for six days, because it happens. Two to three days is common. One to three days is very common. Three to five, seven days is pretty common. Seven to 10 days without a stool is not uncommon. My record, I now have two families who swear to me they went 21 days without a stool. The one of them was a medical student. His wife and he were the only people in town. No one else changed a baby. The other one is my nurse practitioner in ENT. She said her child did not poop for 21 days. The last poop will, was soft. The next poop will be soft. It's just going to be ginormous, and I hope they're not out somewhere. Hope they're home with lots of wipes. Okay. Um, and then I mentioned earlier, just being aware of that almost term infant, the 36, 37 weekers are notoriously poor breastfeeders, um, increasing the risk of jaundice due to age and poor feeding and all that good stuff. So don't trust them. They look big, but often they are not great feeders. Um, and then I get this, asked this question a lot. Is there a difference between breastfeeding and providing breast milk? And um, my answer is yes. I love for babies to breastfeed at the breast. I will be happy with express breast milk if that's all I can have. But breastfeeding at the breast provides incremental increasing fat during the course of the feeding to make for um, in decreasing flow, but increasing quality of milk with regard to calories and fat. Um, there's lots of communication between the baby and the mom with regard to saliva, um, perhaps even transferring from the baby to the breast and then allowing mom to make those precious antibodies to fight whatever they have been exposed to. So RSV, flu, coronavirus, whatever du jour, um, there is some direct communication allowing mom's body to kick in to help that immune system. Um, there's improved hormonal stimulation, so increasing um, the whole access of prolactin and oxytocin and being um, milk more abundant. And then again, that important bonding opportunity that happens um, particularly with the um, oxytocin being the driver of that and just um, helping families get to the point where they are feeling great about their relationship and allowing things to heal. We know that breastfeeding at the breast decreases maternal bleeding and um, decreases ultimately all kinds of um, long-term things. So just all good stuff. All right, how about a stand and stretch moment? And a little bit of feedback. Dream, how is everything as far as video and microphone and? 
It looks beautiful. You sound great. And I am standing and stretching. All right, everybody, up we go. All right, if everyone wants to see the schnauzer, well, let me see. I'm going to set my clock here. We're going to do... Don't wake her. Don't wake the schnauzer. You're right. I shouldn't wake the schnauzer. <laughs> Don't wake the schnauzer. <laughs> we'll um, see him later. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he'll peek, peek his head up here in a minute. All right, so I'm going to give you one minute okay. from right now. Stand up and stretch. And folks, you're welcome to enter your questions now into the question box or, you know, if you hear a, 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 a if you have an aha moment to put that into the chat box. Yeah, into the chat box. I do have pants on. Yeah, I find it funny all these people on television <laughs> are dressed in their finery and they don't have pants on. And no questions, some questions, comments, dreams. <laughs> uh, no questions so far. Um, you know, I had a, a aha moment when you were talking about keeping baby in their diaper and doing skin to skin, even if they're bottle feeding. And I was thinking that probably helps to get them or, or keep them organized yes. <clears throat> to make it easier to go back from to the breast from the bottle that that skin to skin um, definitely. And then um, I chatted. I'm the only one chatting. <laughs> That that is really important anticipatory guidance to uh, you know about the poop so people don't freak out, but also that anticipatory guidance around the surgery. You know, I, it just blows my mind that people like, oh yeah, I had several breast surgeries. It never occurred to them that it would have any impact. It's just it's yeah. it's just it's amazing to me. It it was an interesting conversation because I felt like. I asked if the team was aware and she said yes, but I still felt like they weren't convinced that what I was saying was, <laughs> was possible. I was like, Ooh, this is really tough. It's not your baby's tongue. <laughs> That's not the problem. So we do right. have one question um, that we um, would like you to restate um, when poops become less plentiful and explain why. Oh, okay. So my theory is that, um, well, it definitely happens around sometime after six weeks, I would say between, uh, I mean, you can say around two months of life, because it's often before I see them back for their two month visit, but it can be after. Um, my theory is that the babies have become very good digesters and absorbers, and there's just not a lot of waste left over. I'm not sure anyone really understands that phenomenon, but in pediatrics, we're really big on anticipatory guidance, which means we want families to be aware of something before it happens so that it is part of normal life and they can go on and it doesn't upset the apple cart too much. And so when I was in my first private practice in Houston, I didn't have a nurse triage person. And so at the end of every lunch hour, I had to, and at the end of every day, I would get a pad of paper with a you know, the scribble notes from the secretary who took all the phone calls and call Susie so-and-so, she hasn't pooped and call Susie, you know, Joey so-and-so, the baby has baby acne. And so after doing that for a long time, um, I got pretty good at, all right, at their two week visit, I'm gonna talk about baby acne because that's gonna blossom at week three. And I'm gonna also mention cradle cap because I'm gonna get those phone calls at week four. And I'm also, at, you know, then we started doing often one month visits, which weren't common either. In the past, we often did two week and two month visits without anything in between. So often at, the, at an early visit, I started talking about that babies, sometimes as they approach two months, you know, their stooling drops off. Um, I'm not sure anyone understands that fully, but I just use the example of they just become good digesters and absorbers. There's not a lot of waste left over and um, you just may not see a stool every day. Any other questions? Thank you, that's it for now. Okay, all right. And my slides are back up or never left? They never left. Okay, all right. No, I do not want to leave the webinar. That would be bad. <laughs> okay. All right, let's move on. We just, to got, one, some... we just got one more um, about sure. the edema that you mentioned. Um, typically, uh, when should that pass? Mm, depends on the mom and the situation and how bad it is. Um, I would say 
within the first week. Um, I have had some delayed onset of milk production in moms who were swollen out to day five, six, seven. And so I would say within the first week, that substantially is, is better, but may impact the early times. All right, we will move on to some latch issues. So what we learned from telehealth um, were that most moms were in, almost all were incredibly tech savvy and the devices they had did a great job. We mainly used um, smartphones, but I had a handful of moms that used tablets and laptops. Moms could easily get in a position and show me what they do. And most babies overall were incredibly cooperative, which was um, amazing. And I, I actually meant to tell Jareen early, if I feel, if you think I'm yelling at you, I feel like when I do those visits with moms, I'm always yelling at them because the babies are crying and I don't know, there's always chaos. So I need to get in a better habit of speaking without yelling at my computer. Um, I found that I could analyze and give families suggestions and probably the best thing for them was that I couldn't reach right in and fix it. I had to explain what I was seeing and ask them how to or explain to them how to change it and they learned to do it themselves. And I do think for the long run that was probably more effective in helping them become better best feeders when I wasn't there. Um, so if telehealth goes away, I will totally miss the efficacy of the first or the, of having that full hour visit. Um, even though we schedule patients for an hour in the office, it never works that way. A dad I saw two weeks ago said, I got to tell you, this was about 8.30, so I started at 8 o'clock. He said, I got to tell you, I didn't think this was going to work at all. But this was awesome. You were awesome. The baby was awesome. Mom was awesome. And he said, and it's only 8.30. And I said, right. And so not only have we examined your baby and watched your baby feed, now you're going to show me you bottle feed the baby and mom's going to pump. And we finished the whole other half hour and got an amazing amount of um, work in there. So it was great. Um, moms are comfortable in their own space. They're often talking to me where they feed their baby. I was really surprised and very jealous at the number of moms who were sitting in their bed, cross-legged Indian style, because I find it challenging to sit that way these days, but <laughs> I feel like I sit in a chair too much. Um, and again, the restraints of distance were probably beneficial for me. I couldn't reach on and reach out and fix things. I had to explain to them what I wanted. Um, my schnauzer used to have a Winnie the Pooh who's here and he is my assistant. You can see that Winnie has been attacked by the schnauzer. But this is really what I used as my main prop because I felt like it was actually big enough for them to see. And when I was looking and teaching positioning, Winnie was um, the breastfeeder. Riley was not happy. Um, so as you know, for breastfeeding, um, lots of moms have problems. Um, and the most common problems that are probably coming down the pike for you are nipple and breast pain and low milk supply. But there's always others that are on the list. Um, at least 30% 30, 30 of women, and I, I found this statistic, and I actually think it's higher. A uh, percent of women experience at least one breastfeeding problem at two weeks postpartum and many seek help from their primary care provider. So um, in, the, in the picture, you can actually see what I was talking about engorgement. I mean, while the milk is in the ducts and the ducts are enlarged, um, and the, I mean, the alveolar glands are enlarged, the area around it, you can actually see the edema. So if you're trying to express the milk you know from the alveoli and out into the ducts and out toward the nipple if there is a lot of edema in the tissue around it that's going to be impaired so we're going to talk about that a little bit in a second so my ideal breastfeeding scenario is a hungry not a hangry baby if they're already to the point where they're so hungry that they can't organize themselves i love those that word dream um, when you mentioned about making them skin to skin, if they can't organize themselves and calm down enough to attach, then we need to do something. So <clears throat> if the babies are sleeping, when we start the exam part, I will definitely have moms and dads undress them down to their diaper. That will usually wake them up. Um, 
honestly, I actually prefer that they cry during that because then I can actually, if I haven't yet gotten a good look in their mouth, I'm really excited when they're crying, if I can see them lift their tongue because with, with concerns for tongue tie, we're more concerned about lift and not extension or protrusion of the tongue. So um, that little bit of crying when they're undressing them is not a problem for me. And then um, doing some oromotor stim if they're really not very awake or interested. Um, I had another thought and I can't remember what it was, so we will just move on. So oral motor stim exercises have become my friend. Um, we are starting to work with our occupational therapists because I just think they're brilliant at picking up on all of the specifics and subtleties of babies in their feeding. I certainly feel like over the years I've, I've acquired some and I, I think that organization um, of watching a baby organize themselves to feed is really important and I think there's many steps to it. But for me, again, undressing, maybe they'll cry, you can see their tongue. If they're still not very interested, if they're fussy or they're sleeping, we'll start to do a little bit of stim. Um, I'll often have moms just kind of start and you know call it chapstick, which might be misleading, but I just want them to use their finger to kind of slowly trace around their baby's lips and just kind of want to see what the baby does with that. Often it just kind of enlivens them a little bit and makes them a little more interested in, in kind of exploring that um, finger with perhaps hopefully the tip of their tongue. Then I'll have moms brush down their nose across their upper lip philtrum, that little area between your nose and your lip is called a philtrum. And so brushing the nose, upper lip, down to the lower lip and maybe to the chin. And just kind of seeing what that does. Often you will elicit a little bit of a suck reflex with that or a little bit of a um, just a rooting reflex. And often you will also get to see some tongue um, protrusion or at least some action. Probably I find this one to be the most interesting and the hard part with finger sweep, um, especially if if dads are home and they can be the videographer, I'm thrilled because then I, al I always like them both to see what's going on and it just gives us one more set of hands. But putting the finger in the mouth, running it all the way from the back of the lower gum line across the front to the other side and going back and forth. All the while kind of talking about like, you know, watch what your baby's doing. Watch that tongue because if the baby's pretty calm and quiet and kind of engaged in this, they're starting to take their tongue and follow the finger from side to side. And so one of the things I really want to do when the concern is a tongue tie is show them like I, I am overall not that concerned about what we are seeing. I want to see what the tongue does because what we see might not really give us enough information about mobility of the tongue. And so families are always like, wow, look at that, especially if the babies are pretty engaged and are moving their tongue pretty nicely. And then often I'll have them, um, you know, just do a little bit of a digital suck. So put the finger, you know, ideally pad up. You can do it pad down. I think pad up seems more comfortable with your finger on, the, on their palate as opposed to their tongue. But um, again, being careful if moms have long fingernails and things like that. But giving the finger pad um, for them to suck and then kind of having them describe what that feels like. Can they feel the tongue on the lower aspect of their finger um, and playing a little bit of tug of war with it. Um, in the office, um, I guess as a pediatrician, I always washed clean hands and did this just with my, my hands. Um, in ENT clinic, they're pretty big on using gloves, and so I will often glove to do this aspect. Um, I'm not sure there's a right answer. I guess cleanliness and gloves would always be a good thing. During COVID, I guess we're always gloving, but. So, and there's a, a nice little picture. You can see that baby, she's doing a little bit of exercises with the cheeks. You can see those cheeks are nice and full. And um, it's just a fun way to kind of engage the baby. If they're already angry and hungry and mad, sometimes I'll just tell them, let's put them to the breast. Or and sometimes we'll even start with half an ounce of formula in the bottle or express breast milk in the bottle. If we can't organize the baby enough to latch, um, we'll often take just the edge off hunger to get them to a place where we can do that. All right, moving on to breast exam, and I'm assuming for you guys, this is also just a brief part of your um, assessment as well. Um, I put a disclaimer in my notes that I'm doing a breast exam uh, in relation to breastfeeding, um, because I'm certainly not doing a breast exam with the 
intent of identifying lumps or breast cancer or anything else. So I'm overall doing a quick evaluation to assess um, the shape of the breast, engorgement or lack thereof of engorgement, perhaps the size, the weight of the breast, the shape and the size of the nipple, uh, looking for any scars. I'm assuming if mom had surgery and I asked the question, she would have told me, but if I didn't ask the question, um, sometimes after um, breast reduction, you can see the scar around the perimeter of the areola where I mentioned they actually took the areola nipple complex off the breast, removed the breast tissue, put it back on in the place they wanted and sewed it back on. They certainly don't go back to the microscopic level of reattaching um, the, you know, the lactiferous um, sinuses and ducts. They don't go back to, um, you know, obviously reattaching nerves and things like that. Um, so looking at the shape and the size of the nipple, looking for, as Dr. Sriraman likes to remind me, uh, and asking, uh, not only looking, but asking about any history of nipple piercings. We've had some moms with some significant pierce holes that also um, either complicate or increase flow from the nipple. Um, assessing elasticity, how much, you know, if this baby can attach to this, like, like, is the breast tissue elastic enough that the baby's gonna be able to pull it into their mouth? And sometimes that's a huge piece of the, the challenge. How much effort will it take to manage the breast? Is the breast large and we're doing a lot of effort to manage the breast and then we've gotta manage the baby. And I always joke, now I want you to move the breast aside so I can see their lower lip and we need like eight sets of hands. So hopefully dad is there or someone is there to help us. Um, just wanted to review those quick terms of the lobes of the breast made up of all of that alveol alveoli. Um, I do encourage moms that <clears throat> even if breastfeeding with this pregnancy wasn't stellar, with the next pregnancy, with all of the menstrual cycles between this pregnancy and the next one, plus the second gestation and pregnancy, that all of the aspects of the breasts continue to differentiate and grow. So just because milk supply and breast tissue wasn't overly adequate for this pregnancy, she should have further differentiation of alveoli um, and ducts that should hopefully impact um, the next pregnancy with increased supply. Um, areola, nipple, milk ducts, alveolar cells. Yep, okay. So this really, I, I kind of joke sometimes that if all mom's breasts were shaped like a bottle nipple, I wouldn't have a job. Because the overwhelming majority of babies, we can find a bottle nipple that they will attach to. And we're not, we don't really have the option to change those with moms. So effective breastfeeding really requires babies to fine tune their tongue movements and jaw and adapt to their mother's nipple and breast anatomy. There's not a whole lot we can do about that. Um, Nipple shields come up a lot. I find that the nurseries give them out for all kinds of reasons. Um, obviously our favorite reasons are inverted nipples and um, flat nipples that again aren't very elastic that just give the baby some additional something, some stimulus to actually attach onto the breast and hopefully draw milk out. Um, I do find them helpful often for late preterm or babies that again need a little bit more of something of substance to provide a stimulus to suck. Um, I try my darndest if babies don't need them to get rid of them for moms because I find that they're an impediment for long-term satisfaction just because you have to find it, clean it, put it on. But overall they're not an entirely bad thing. I don't, I try not to overuse them and I always try to find out why they were brought into place. So a handful of years ago, and it, honestly, maybe I noticed Allison Stubbe, who I love, who's um, doing that webinar for you guys later in the month um, from Chapel Hill. I feel like she was the first person who said orobubular interface um, for me. But um, so it really, it, it really is a dance. And um, again, it's often not the tongue that's the problem because it might be the mom. So. Looking at these two, how might the attachment go? Taking into account, is this a small baby? Is this a small mouth? Is this a receded chin? Is this a preemie? Is this a large breast? Is this an engorged breast? Is it a hard to manage breast? Is it a large nipple? Is it a flat nipple, a verted nipple, a small elastic nipple, not elastic breast tissue? I could go on and on. So there's no one size fits all definitely and trying to make that match um, is challenging. I don't know what to do 
in the situation where the nipple is very wide in diameter. Like there's only so much, so many tricks that we have. And if the baby is little and the nipple is very wide in diameter, it's really just going to take time and, and practice. I've seen it work, um, but, you know, continuing to encourage the baby to open wide at the breast, helping to shape the breast so that it's, you know, approachable to the infant to get her mouth around. Um, and again, waiting and being patient because in a few weeks she's going to be bigger, stronger, and, and that will happen. Fortunately, I don't see wide nipples very often. Um, assessing a latch, I'm going to talk about like my most successful tricks and I'm probably again a little bit too hands-on in the office, particularly in the general peds practice because I have a very limited time with families and we often, you know, during any visit or any initial newborn visit, regardless of what moms are doing, if they're even bottle feeding, I'll ask, you know, had you thought about breastfeeding? Like, and if I get any kind of encouragement, um, I'll often say, well, you know, did you try in the hospital? How did that go? And if they said they tried and it wasn't successful or they've really struggled or they've quit or it was painful, um, I don't, I'll often you know, quickly look at my watch and say, and I, it's really not true most of the time, but I'll say, I have time, let's try this. And so if moms and babies are interested and hopefully I have a resident or a medical student with me, we kind of go through the process. Um, and I'll, I'll often let moms show me what they're doing if I have lots of time. Um, if they just don't even know where to start, I'll show them with my best tricks. But I'm going to quickly go through this assessing a latch um, slide and then we'll talk about how to make it work if you're unlimited time. But making sure that the breast and the baby are supported. If moms need to, they can put a roll of a, a washcloth or a towel or I know that um, uh, one of the physicians at BCU had created some sort of a breast sling to kind of hold the breast up. That's pretty cool. Um, making sure that the babies have a, the you know biggest mouth as you as you can get. I think that I hear that a lot. Well, I, I think my baby's tongue tight because he won't open his mouth very big. And I'm like, okay, those two things to me are not related at all. So um, we got to figure out how to get your baby to open bigger. Um, we want the chin against the breast, the lower, the tongue over the lower gum. Um, you can sometimes pull the baby's lip away to kind of look at that. More areola below the nipple in the baby's mouth. So we call that an asymmetric latch. This isn't the best picture of that. It's going to show you that in a second. Um, Ear, temporalis, jaw movement, not just mouth suck. Um, lots of bursts and pauses. The cheeks aren't hollowed out. It's relatively pain-free. It might be initially uncomfortable at first latch, but should improve. And as the baby stays attached and you know sucking continues, they should hear swallows. And ideally, when the baby comes off, the nipple shouldn't be pinched or at least looking uncomfortable. Um, that good latch, as you know, is that huge wide mouth. And I tell families, it, because sometimes I can't see it, look at your baby's mouth. Do you think he could open it any wider? And sometimes we'll say, put a little pressure on his chin to open the mouth a little bit wider. But if his lips are pursed, you know he doesn't have much breast tissue in his mouth. But if you think he couldn't get it any wider, then you're good. That wide mouth latch pulls the breast tissue into the mouth. It optimizes that intraoral vacuum. Right, so when babies open their mouth, the seal that they've created has created a vacuum in their mouth cavity, which pulls the milk out of the breast along with the milk ejection reflex into the mouth. The nipple is far back into the mouth. It doesn't get damaged by the tongue and the palate and everything else. Um, and that's what's really gonna help families be successful, which is very different than the baby who's latched to a nipple. So if you're just latched to the nipple, all you're doing is abrading. There's no use of that intraoral vacuum. You're just abrading that nipple. And the body, I always go back to Mother Nature being incredibly savvy. Um, there are tons of nerve endings in the nipple. So if the baby just has nipple in their mouth, yes, they're going to be very uncomfortable and sore and they're going to abrade that nipple. And moms, they're going to know because they have pain. And so the deeper the baby gets on and the less pressure that's applied to the nipple and more applied to the breast and areola where there are fewer nerve endings, the discomfort is much less. So alignment at the breast is key. And I really feel like, and I read an article this morning and I think it said like over 80% of moms who are breastfeeding could have some fixes to their alignment to make things better. The majority of moms who have at least adequate, if not abundant supply 
their babies in line and attachment is probably less important, especially the moms with oversupply, because they're flooding their babies anyway, often. And the baby's latch is less important in milk transfer because the milk is just flooding them. But in a mom who is struggling with supply or having pain, that alignment is key. So again, in the office, I may not have a ton of time to let mom show me what she does, but on the video, I'm saying, all right, so show me first what you're doing and how that's working for you. I like to assess the infant's interest, like are they really, you know, gangbuster trying to do this? And I'm always encouraged when they're excited and they're trying to latch. Um, I find a lot of moms, and, and I think it's okay if the baby does it by themselves and they're latched well, but if they're not, we need to do a few things to assist. And then working to optimize position and attachment. I'm gonna just see what my next slide is. Okay, so, I'm gonna use my bear here for a second. And I would say that the majority of the time when I ask moms to show me what they do, moms are placing baby in cradle hold and they're getting, I'm hoping you can see me. I should probably see where I am, but. Um, so they're putting the baby's head in their arm and they're planning to feed on the same breast. And I, the first thing I do is I'm looking at where the baby's nose is with regard to the nipple. And you can see in this position, I either would have to take my breast and move it to the baby, or the baby would have to tuck his chin to get his nose to my nipple, which is a problem. So exercise number two of the morning is tuck your chin to your chest and try and open your mouth and tuck your chin to your chest, keep it down there and try and swallow. Both are very challenging. <laughs> And so that is why pretty much I think this position, at least in a family, in a baby who's learning to feed, um, is not optimal because alignment is not great. I sometimes feel like, sometimes I think they're um, feeling a little claustrophobic. They can't adjust because they're shoved in this corner between the arm and the breast and what have you. So I'm gonna now show you my tricks and you probably know most of these already, but. Cross cradle for me, so what works almost every time, and the residents are always amazed, and I love doing this with residents. So again, I walk in with a resident, I see a family who has already resorted to exclusive bottle feeding, but the baby's only four days old, mom wanted to breastfeed, she didn't really get help, and I'm like, great, let's do it. So we put the baby, I'll show her first with her baby, I'll take the baby and do this, I'll teach her cross cradle hold, I'll tell her, you know, if your arms are pretty long like mine, you can put a leg on either side of your elbow. Um, I've got my four fingers under the baby's bottom cheek and I've got my thumb on the back of his, um, of his head as well, or on the occiput, I'm not cupping the head. So I got my four fingers under, got my thumb on top. I'm gonna line the nose of the baby up with the nipple. What I don't wanna do, I don't want the baby to drift laterally. I'm going to interrupt myself. Hey, Jereen, can you tell me if, like, video-wise, you guys can see me fine? Yeah, I can see you pretty well. You might can just tilt down, like, a tiny bit. Yeah, perfect. Right there. Okay. Right there. So, I, again, want, I got my four fingers under, my thumb on the top. I'm holding the occiput, not the back of the head. I've got the baby's full weight supported on my forearm. I've got nose lined up with nipple, not beyond. Every, just about, this is the thing, and this is the hardest thing to tell moms to fix, because I don't know if midline, I don't know, sometimes I feel like I'm using words people don't get, but <laughs> I don't want your baby to drift laterally, I want you to pull him back so that nose is lined, I want a bullseye on with the breast. So the other thing is, and I put this quote in there, so all of this is from, a, and I'm going to show you the pictures, this is from Jack Newman's Canadian Breastfeeding Foundation site. And he says, think of it not as bringing your baby's head into or near the breast, but the body into the body and the head will follow as if serving your baby to you on a platter. And what I tell families, what I love about this position, you're supporting head, shoulders, hips, everything is in nice alignment. And the head, if anything, we don't want it tucked. We almost want it in a little bit of an extension or upright sniffing position. So that as you're bringing your baby to you on the platter, hopefully the chin hits the breast first, you get a wide mouth gape and they attach. With the left hand, I'm having them hold from underneath and I call it a taco hold or a U hold. 
if we smash the breast in a sandwich and the baby's mouth is coming at them vertically, we're not shaping it into the optimal position. So holding from under, waiting the baby for to open super big, super, super, super big, tap in their upper lip with the nipple if we need to, waiting for them to open big. And then the other key thing is pulling them on faster than you think is normal. <laughs> if you wait and allow them to chew their way on, moms will get pain. So um, go, the next bullet says, you know, baby's chin should be far away from their chest and all that means is just not tucked. Again, we want it in that extension position. Aiming for that lower lip as far away from the base of the nipple as possible so that they reach up, they have that asymmetric latch and the tongue draws a lot of breast into the mouth. It, and the residents, so the, the moms will often go, Oh, that's so much better. And then we'll continue to chat and the babies are attached and they're latching and like the whole vibe in the room changes like from I didn't know if I wanted to do this to isn't this cool and the residents walk out and look at me and go that was really cool. So we make breastfeeding supporters every day. All right, so here is another picture from Jack Newman's site. Um, and he's just showing that the base of the hand is firmly so the my fingers are under and the base of my hand is at, at the baby's shoulders. So again, I'm, I'm not cupping and I'm not changing the angle of the head. I'm actually using the pressure of my hand between the baby's shoulders to bring him all in alignment onto the breast. Ideally with that wide mouth. And we can encourage that wide mouth with that tapping a little bit too. Um, and this is mom's view while latching the baby because she's kind of above the baby. And we're also using that other hand to kind of shape the breast into the best bullet shape so we can get that breast as far back in the baby's mouth as possible. All right, so if the other thing that we can show them too, if moms, I'm gonna tip you down again a little bit, if the baby's nose still seems too against the breast, we're kind of tucking, I always say tuck your, elbow in and you'll notice that the baby kind of if you're if you're using him as a platter or on a platter his nose is going to rock off the breast bit and then she's not going to have to make an airway and then she can also use that hand to kind of put a little pressure on the lower jaw if that um if the lower jaw is not uh open as wide as she thinks it could be all right i'm going to fix the camera again are we am i back to decent position yes yeah. Um, one person did say they can't yeah. see the video. Judy, if you look at the top of the slide in the middle of the screen, <clears throat> you might see like three small lines. You can put your cursor and uh, pull it up or down to make the slide smaller and the video larger or reveal the video if you don't see it at all. Let me know if that works. Thanks, Dr. Brennan. Yeah. All right, so with engorgement and lymphatic massage, which I've mentioned a few times, remembering that engorgement is not just about the milk in the breast, it can be breast congestion with other tissue fluid, um, which are often made worse by all of the IV fluids during labor and delivery. Um, this can cause the areola and the nipple to flatten, making latching more difficult. I often say it's kind of like latching onto a basketball, like they just keep trying and they can't pull anything um, apart from the surface. It can result in some pretty sore and cracked nipples and poor emptying of the breast. Pumping an engorged breast can actually make the problem worse because you're pulling fluid into the area and the, the actual um, milk ducts are getting smaller and smaller because the fluid around them is getting bigger and bigger. So pulling lymphatic fluid toward the nipple area, which in, so what we want to do is help the natural drainage through the lymphatics, which are in your axilla or your underarm and the sternal nodes. So we suggest that families use a light touch breast massage. So they can use olive oil, coconut oil, something with a super incredibly light touch towards the axilla for a few minutes to help mobilize the fluid out of the breast. And then you might be familiar with just doing some reverse pressure softening um, of the areola around the nipples so that that's a little bit more prominent so the baby can actually, so that tissue is a little bit more elastic and that you can actually move some. Um, or shape the breast to get it in the baby's mouth. You may find that you need to do some hand expression to soften the or, or areola in order to get the baby on. Um, this is a video, it's the basics of breast massage and hand expression um, by Maya Bowman and Ann Witt, and that is um, online and very lovely. And the link is there for you. 
and um, Jareen will get all of these slides later this morning. Moving on to nipple pain and damage. Um, nipple pain is very common in the early weeks of postpartum. More often than not, it's poor infant attachment. Um, the most importantly, just fixing the latch, checking alignment, making sure the infant is on deep enough. If we have to, nurse for shorter periods on that side, feed on the less sore side, allow for some air drying. Um, lanolin cream is often, or ointment is often helpful unless mom is allergic to wool. That's always a good question. Um, doesn't happen very often, but I've heard it twice now. Um, Again, we mentioned the nerve endings and the nipple are abundant and are definitely a sign that this is not a good attachment. So hopefully families and moms are listening to their body. It is amazing to me the amount of injury that some moms will feed through. Um, and so it, it really is important to fix it and allow moms to heal. Nipple damage um, can initially just be a nuisance and with a little bit of lubrication and allowing it to heal they may heal very nicely and and families just move on sometimes that happens in the hospital and then after a little bit of rest we can certainly fix the attachment um recognizing that that it that nipple ongoing nipple damage will often get colonized sometimes that is candida or thrush particularly if the babies have thrush in their mouth ongoing cracks and things like that that we think are candida and in the past were you know if moms had you know sharp shooting pains and often treated for what we thought was you know candida in the ducts which we don't think is anymore um, but regardless that area can get colonized also with staph aureus so treating for both is important at times um, evaluating the infant for thrush if you're treating the mom or the baby for candida uh, definitely you know, someone should consider treating the other. I would say that is not a pediatric norm. They will often treat the baby for thrush and forget that the mom is breastfeeding and neglect to treat her. Um, treatment, usually we can manage with a topical antifungal and or a topical antibiotic, um, plus minus a mild topical steroid. Um, Dr. Newman, the lactation consultant from Canada I mentioned, has a triple nipple ointment um, that he prescribes. His is lovely, but it's a compounded product, so it uses a powdered fluconazole, which is challenging to get. So I'll often just, um, or myconazole powder, so I'll often just use a, a triple um, concoction that I have moms make in their hand. Um, I have never seen herpes simplex virus of the breast, but certainly something to think about if there are painful, discrete sores above the nipple or areola. Um, usually it, it can be on the nipple, but we encourage those moms to not breastfeed, express milk, and discard until those lesions are healed. Um, candida, I already mentioned. Persistent, it usually starts out as just pinkness or itchiness, but can be persistent burning in the nipple during and after feed. May have some radiating pain. Baby may have that thrush in their mouth or the white lesions on their um, tongue and mucosa. Um, most babies don't care if they have thrush unless it's terrible. Um, they feed right through it. Um, so often we'll do, I'll do an oral antifungal for the baby, uh, oral antifungal for mom if it's pretty significant. Um, but usually, again, we can start with just the topical products. Nipple vasospasm, I just wanted to mention, it's certainly not very common, but it's an interesting cause of nipple pain that usually isn't with the feeding, it's usually after the feeding. Um, if you've ever heard of Raynaud syndrome or phenomenon, um, and if you've ever had any numbness or blanching of your fingers or toes when you were out in the cold or out in the grocery store or in the <laughs> freezer section, um, you know what I'm talking about. But these moms, the baby will be, the breast will be and the nipple will be nice and warm because the baby's been latched and feeding. And then when the baby comes off, just that airflow um, of the room across the breast will often trigger this. Um, so there's restricted blood flow to the nipple as the nipple uh, vasospasms and clenches the the vessels clamp down, leading to some blanching, possibly some color change, um, can be pretty significant. I had a mom once who said, I had to run out to the car to get something in the cold, and she said she just stood out there clutched because it was so painful. Um, often with a family history, any kind of connective tissue disease, these moms are um, more prone to it. So we just talk about avoiding cold temperatures, covering, so if the baby did, you know, 
detaches from the breast, um, covering that relatively quickly and not letting the air hit it for too long. Um, wearing warm clothing, sometimes using a warm pack or something like that. I've never had to use low-dose nifedipine, but it, it, I, it's in all of the literature about being helpful. And this is an interesting one because sometimes moms will talk about this and, and until you um, really sort out like when is the pain and what is the pain, you could certainly confuse it for bad latch or infection or something else. All right. So I was going to give everybody another chance to stand and stretch. This time, stand on one foot, pat your head, rub your belly, and count to 10. <laughs> or run to the bathroom or get a drink or whatever you need to do. I will set the clock for a minute. One, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> yeah. I I was tempted to read a few questions while I'm patting and rubbing, but um, yeah. I mean, you got to get your stretch break too in, Dr. B. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. So, um, Catherine was uh, saying, you know, that telehealth is really forcing us to be better verbal communicators. And of course, yeah. within uh, WIC, Dr. Brenner, um, none of the folks on the call, well, uh, the vast majority of our designated breastfeeding experts are not IBCLC. So of course, um, we would be, you know, as you described, directing the parent to um, try some of those exercises or um, touching the baby. We would not be touching them typically in the um, um, WIC clinic anyway. That would be beyond our scope. Um, oh. One question is, do you talk about beginning prenatal hand expression of colostrum um, prenatally around 34, 36 weeks when there's a history of low supply that may be due to uh, low tone or IGT? Yeah, um, so I have not had the opportunity to discuss that. Because um, you're cause the pediatrician, the not the OB. <laughs> yeah, so I, although, so with our upcoming future breastfeeding clinic, that is, you know, we were supposed to open October 1st with like full service, all breastfeeding problems, and we're still puttering along because now staffing is at a uh, an all-time low. Um, we were told to be careful. We knew that... Uh, a lot of the other clinics around the country, they were saying that moms were calling and arranging for appointments for babies who weren't even born yet that didn't even have a name because they'd had mm. a problem with their, before because they had a problem with the previous pregnancy. So um, yeah, I don't get to do a lot of anticipatory guidance with about that because I just, I'm not in that situation, yeah. but I think yeah. we're the population. Well, rather, I, I should have rephrased it in another way. What is your opinion about us providing that type of prenatal you know have you read anything that finds that that is a uh, helpful or effective do you think that we should add that to our educational repertoire you know I actually because probably it hasn't come up for me I haven't okay. read anything I've remembered <laughs> but I can certainly I'm happy to look into that thank you thanks for the stretch break yeah okay all right so we're headed into the home stretch um, these are just a couple pictures from our original milk bank. Um, this is Peaches and Kitty. One of Kitty's one of our lactation consultants. Peaches is one of our milk lab techs. But what I wanted to illustrate here is just the um, immense volume that we get of pumped milk um, and that oversupply. Uh, I was mentioning I see as much oversupply as I see undersupply. But in the milk bank, I talk to a lot of moms with just incredible pump volumes and. My question, and I've always, I, I would love to do just this as a study one day and just say, do you know how much milk you actually need for your baby? Because I don't feel like moms ever have an endpoint and that more is better. And then perhaps sometimes it's a status symbol and that they are pumping inordinate amounts of milk every day that they, they really don't have any idea of what their baby will need on a full, when they're up to full volume. And so I try to, remind moms that their babies are going to be at their peak milk volume between four to six months of life 
And just like with formula, we estimate that they probably are gonna need somewhere in the realm of 32 to 35 ounces a day. So if you already know you are feeding your baby 100% and you're storing another 20 ounces of milk a day, you probably don't need to do that. <laughs> and like helping moms begin to bring their supply down a little bit, which may improve their lives and actually their baby's feeding experience. Um, so I already mentioned insufficient glandular tissue, and this was a um, picture, and again, this is the least common reason we see for low milk supply, but I wanted to mention that. So that's the photo down on the bottom. Um, those moms can often have some very unusual breast anatomy with either a kind of a cone-shaped breast or a, a long elongated breast or some breast asymmetry without a lot of glandular tissue or glandular tissue that's mainly at the um, around and in the areola area. So certainly not a common reason for low milk supply, but one that everyone should be aware of. So I would say low milk supply, as you guys probably hear, is a common cause for stopping breastfeeding. Um, but in order for us to have an adequate supply, we need sufficient mammary tissue, normal hormone levels, including thyroid function, and regular removal of milk. If we don't remove milk, that you know everything will begin to shut down. I tell moms, making milk is a very expensive process for your body. With burning up to 500 calories a day, your body has no desire to do this. And if you are not removing milk for your baby, your milk will be gone probably within 10 to 14 days if you did nothing. Can we bring it back? Sure, with some effort, we can bring it back. Can we bring it back to 100% of volume? I never say yes and I never say no. Like, I don't know what's gonna happen and I don't know how much energy and time and um, ability you're gonna have to do this. So um, if we can optimize it in the beginning, we try to do that. Um, mentioned earlier, women who report no breast enlargement during pregnancy may be at risk of insufficient glandular tissue, breast reduction or surgery may compromise supply. Making sure we're optimizing early skin to skin, monitoring weight gain, um, performing manual compression of the breast if needed and improving breast drainage. Uh, I'm not gonna go into this for a long time, this is a little complicated slide, but just reminding you on the, um, on the left that prolactin is super important. That's the direct stimulation of the nipple um, and it's based, prolactin is released based on the frequency, intensity, duration, and efficacy of suck and milk removal. Um, oxytocin is the indirect hormone that is from suckling and is definitely part of this neuroaffective neurosensory pathway back to the brain. This guy's name, I named him Phil. He is the guy in charge of the supply. If he is buying the milk or drinking the milk or removing the milk, he's gonna bring in more. If no one, if this milk isn't moving and it's just sitting there, Phil is not gonna restock that breast. So his name is Phil because that is the feedback inhibitor of lactation, which is we think a peptide on the whey protein that milk left in the breast down regulates supply. So Phil, if he's, you know, if there's just tons of milk laying in that breast, the breast is not going to begin to move milk. I find this interesting when moms tell me that, well, if I wait a long time between pumps, I can remove more milk. And I'm like, yeah, but ultimately that milk left in the breast is down regulating your supply. So more efficient and effective removal is going to help that supply. Um, at the Milk Bank, we're super grateful for moms with oversupply, but it is often a great masquerader. So I'm not going to go a ton into undersupply. Um, you can certainly, I don't, I probably again, beyond the scope of practice of recommending galactagogues, but they can certainly eat healthy, eat oatmeal. Um, sometimes we recommend, you know, whether or not they work very well has been not well determined, but fenugreek and marshmallow and a couple of the other lactation herbs. Um, occasionally we can recommend, um, I usually recommend moms go back to their obstetrician to talk about Reglan. We use that as a side effect to increase prolapse and hopefully increase supply. But I'd like to talk a little bit more about oversupply um, because undersupply really is about effective milk removal and you just have to figure out how to do that with the baby or the pump. Oversupply, those moms most of the time don't know they have oversupply, but they have this baby that's gassy, fussy, grumpy, spitty. Sometimes my favorite story was this baby that every time the mom undressed the baby and put him to the breast, I mean, she just lost it. 
And when I got the story, mom was breastfeeding a lot, pumping a lot. She was flooding the baby. Every time the baby attached, she was gulping, choking. And I truly think she was fearful of breastfeeding. And every time mom got her in the position to do it, if she was sitting up, she could lay down and feed her a little bit better. But the baby was just hysterical. Um, and often these babies are just fussy feeders. They on, off, bite, arch, all different kinds of stuff. And the majority of these moms don't realize that too much milk is the problem or they realize that they have a forceful letdown so they'll pump that off and now they're increasing their milk removal so they make more. Um, sometimes those moms have painful nipples um, because the babies are biting to control the flow. Um, and the majority of the time the moms have just have no idea that they have such supply. How I often get to this is finding out how much they're feeding the baby at the breast and then how much they're pumping. Again, back to that, it's complicated to get a good answer because sometimes like what they're pumping, they might be feeding. So I really want to know how much they're technically storing. But so how many times a day do you pump? How much do you remove from both breasts? And I'll usually get a volume from each side. Okay, so you're telling me that most of the time you're removing four to six ounces every three hours in addition <laughs> to feeding your baby at the breast every three hours. So you're storing, and I'll try to calculate what that volume is. I had a 13 day old recently that I think the mom was already storing in excess of 20 ounces a day with um, exclusively breastfeeding our baby. Um, so I'll often ask, you know, do you know how much your baby will ultimately need per day? Are you gonna go back to work? Do you need a huge stockpile? How can we help you bring this down? Um, because, and then we kind of talk about, all right, so your baby, based on your baby's age and weight, needs about 20 ounces a day. You're feeding your baby 100%. You're storing 20 ounces a day. So you right now have milk for two babies. How can we begin to make you guys um, regulate that out a little bit? Moms who have oversupply, I believe the theory is that when they have a large supply, it is often in lower fat milk. And so the babies are often a little bit more gassy, fussy, uncomfortable too, because they're getting a lower quality product if they have a big supply. Particularly if moms are breastfeeding on one breast for 10 or 15 minutes and then switching breasts where they're getting the low fat milk again from the other side. So again, when you have a gassy, fussy, uncomfortable, frequent feeder, ask about poop. Typically those moms will tell you that those stools are green or can be green, frothy, fluffy, or explosive. Occasionally in those babies or the babies will start to hear about, I thought I saw a little blood, it looked like a little string or a little mucus strands. And the easiest way to fix those babies is you know, get them to get the hind milk. So we'll often, these babies often the story is I'm breastfeeding for 10 minutes on one side and then 10 minutes on the other, or 15 on one and 15 on the other. So we'll go back to, I want you to finish the first breast first. And particularly, we may even say, you know, just offer one breast per feeding. And then at the next feed, you're going to go to the next breast. With the understanding that if the breast that they usually offer second at that feeding is uncomfortable, we want them to hand express or gently um, pump to comfort, but not to empty. We're not trying to remove more, a ton of milk. We're trying to make them comfortable. We don't want to grow the supply even further, which often happens. That hind milk that's at the later part of the feeding is more bang for your buck, higher in calories, um, achieving technically a lower volume of ultimate milk intake. If you put the baby to the other side, they're going to get a large flood of low calorie milk that's, um, or high low calorie milk that's higher in sugar and low in fat. So they're gonna have to take more to feel full. If you're using one breast per feed for the most part, they're less likely to spit up. That makes you feel full. You're going to get a longer duration between feeds. You're going to get more successful breastfeeding, empty or breast emptying on that side, ensuring ongoing production. And, but again, you do have to care for the other side until the next feeding so that it's not, you know, we're not putting moms at risk for um, blocked ducts or uh, mastitis. Um, successful milk removal, we've said a zillion times already today, results in more milk production. That feedback inhibitor of lactation is the whey protein that um, signals those leftovers in the breast that downregulate supply. And the opposite is true. The more we remove milk, the more we drive that supply up. I um, wanted to just briefly touch on that lip and tongue tie issues because it's just become such an epidemic, as I mentioned. 
um, I learned during COVID, we knew this before, but lip and tongue tie are not an emergency, particularly lip tie issues I can address very easily over the telehealth um, uh, technique. Most tongues are not so tight that feeding is impaired. And usually if we work on all of the other issues that impact breastfeeding, we fix any concerns about the tongue. Most infants with correct positioning, even if their tongue is a little bit restricted, do very well. And that most moms who have nipple pain, it's usually not just the tongue, there's additional reasons for that. Um, we'll talk lip tie real quick first. So you can see that the superior labial frenulum, which is that piece of tissue that attaches the upper lip to the upper gum. Um, the literature suggests that this is a growing controversy on identification, classification, and subsequent significance of this tissue. And I will tell you that the more you look for them, the more you're puzzled and the more you go, huh, and the more those get called by, I feel like, providers in the community a lip tie. We never used to look underneath the lip. Now we're looking underneath the lip and everybody's like, well, what do we do with that? Um, the paper that I was reading this morning suggested that diagnoses of lip tie are up over 90%. So Jareen and I were chatting the other day about, Lord, like, what is it? Do we have all these new midline defects in babies that they have all this lip tissue and tongue tissue? No. And I think uh, we'll talk about um, why I think this is becoming more prominent, but I think they've always been there. And for the most part, no one's ever really bothered to look. And the overwhelming majority of the time, it really doesn't matter. But definitely, the more you look for them, the more confusing it gets. So I don't know, maybe we should just stop look, looking. But with correct positioning and alignment, most babies' lips can lift enough so that the inner aspect of that mucosa is a, providing a seal, a moist seal, of the lip to the skin of the breast. So, you know, I, I've had one of our occupational therapists send me photos and she was pulling this lip up and showing me that it was blanching the tissue underneath. And I was like, well, if you lift it that high, you could blanch anything. And for the most part, the lip does not need to lift that high. It just needs to make a seal. That tucking of the lip, like moms will say, well, I have to reach in and I have to flip it up. And again, with positioning, as I mentioned earlier, with the camera, if the baby is tuck if their chin is tucked and their upper lip is pressed onto the breast you may find that that lip is actually tucked a bit under but if they're coming at the breast with a nice extension that lip is less likely to be in a position of compression so here are a few more again the more you look the more you'll notice some of them are thick some of them are thin some of them go you know are just attached to the top of the alveolar ridge which is the the upper gum line some of them travel all the way down to the um, the papilla, which is this area right here, and some of them actually appear to wrap underneath. So what do we do with those? Oh, should we clip them? Well, based on appearance alone, we should do nothing. So look and you will note that tissue in just about all infants, thick, thin, short, long. And what I tell families, what this looks like on day five may completely look different at week five, month five, and age five. And I'm not sure I should be worried about his teeth today when all I'm really worried about in the next couple weeks is feeding and let's get the feeding under control and we'll worry about his teeth later. If the lip can lift, again, to allow that moist inner lip mucosa to make a seal on the breast, it should be enough for correct positioning. Listen and look for a break in seal. The lip does not need to entirely flip. Moms don't need to get in there and mess with it if it's, if it's nicely placed. And then I just wanted to put in a comment from uh, the, this is the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. The presence of the frenulum is thought to assist in descent of the central incisor teeth coming down and actually helps probably align them. They recommend waiting until the adult canines are up. So I think I have this in another place too. And orthodontia is being negotiated before clipping that upper lip frenulum unless it's so tight that lip can't move. Scarring after an early clip may ultimately actually increase the size of that diastema or the space between the teeth. And there's a picture of diastema. So the APPD, there's their um, most recent uh, recommendations and management of the frenulum, not just lip, but tongue. So the maxillary, maxillary phrenectomy or clipping that lip tie should not be performed until those canines erupt and should follow orthodontic closure of the space and that releasing that frenulum based on appearance alone is not endorsed at this time. So I really kind of don't really 
worry about those at all. I look at them and I'll reassure them and I'll tell them, I don't know what this is going to look like when your child has baby teeth, but likely either they might fall and it might tear and it really doesn't make a difference if we clip it now or later. Um, it is a very vascular tissue. It bleeds a lot. A lot of our um, docs, our ENT docs don't really like to clip them. If it was super tight, again, totally different story. I would totally see in the office and potentially make a different decision. All right, last couple of minutes on tongue tie or ankyloglossia. So the official definition of tongue tie is congenital developmental anomaly of the tongue characterized by a short, thick lingual frenulum resulting in limitation of tongue movement. Again, I don't really care how it looks as much as I care how it functions. It really only affects a very small percentage of the population, but shocking how many breastfeeding babies it has now come to reportedly affect, which I, again, I think it's just awareness. The tongue's ability to elevate rather than protrude is the most important quality for nursing, feeding, speech, and development of the dental arch. Here are all the cute little baby tongues that I could find um, when we did this lecture on tongue tie probably about 10 years ago for the pediatric residents. And I feel like then I was so focused on teaching the details of what all of these tongues look like and how to identify them that we were really probably biasing physicians to call things um, abnormal when they were not. So the clinical significance of tongue tie, obviously people are concerned at this stage about feeding, but they're also worried about future speech, pronunciation, fluency, quality, especially under pressure, dental health, development of the face is the person at risk for dental caries because they can't stick their tongue out and clean their teeth. Um, social aesthetic, I had a mom the other day tell me that uh, kissing was impacted. Um, appearance, kissing, eating habits, licking, self-esteem. Is there a role in sleep apnea because of the position of the tongue in the mouth? And is there um, a role in gastric esophageal reflux disease in children and adults because of tongue placement? All of these have not been really studied very well, um, but a few things we know. We know that there's been an increase in focus on breastfeeding, an increased awareness that tongue tie can negatively affect breastfeeding. There's lots of lactation pro professionals who have been taught about tongue tie. There is an overwhelming increase in the social media and websites related to tongue tie, and they seem to always tell the good stories. They don't show the complications that we see in the office. Um, and there are an increase in the number of medical providers, particularly dentists who treat tongue tie. I tell all of the families that we see often that um, what we are looking at today, there is tissue present. If you went to one to the dentists in our community that have a laser, they would be happy to take your $250, clip your child's tissue and say goodbye, and you would not have any breastfeeding assistance or change in anything else, which is likely not going to make things better and potentially make things worse. We've had a couple of children um, admitted for dehydration because they refusal to feed afterward. Um, and we've seen, I meant to pull up one of the photos I have of the most ginormous hole under this baby's tongue that was made with a laser. And um, no kidding, that baby didn't eat for a week. I probably wouldn't eat for longer. So again, in the past, I used to teach people about the different types of tongue tie, but again, function is so much more important. Um, the type ones are where it's attached very close to the tip and you're actually seeing an indentation or a notch at the tip. Um, uh, this, the type twos are attached beyond the tip of the tongue um, on or just behind the alveolar ridge. Um, often they're thin and web-like. Number three, function can appear normal or a the tongue can appear normal, but have um, abnormal function with the, you can just kind of see that baby's tongue is a little globby. And then type four is an attachment at the base of the tongue. The tongue looks fine, but doesn't seem to move very well. I do not even use these classification types anymore. I look at um, appearance and function and make a decision about whether it's restricted or not. Um, tongue tie has been, uh, you know, a broad range of attributed symptoms, I would say the one that's most important to me is mom having nipple pain. If moms are having nipple pain or if the baby's failing to thrive or not feeding well or fatiguing during feeds and the tongue is abnormal, I certainly want to see it. But there are certainly, again, that's only one classification system I showed you. There's a few in the dental community, but the otolaryngologists um, really just don't feel like there's one agreed upon classification that just looking at um, appearance, you can make a decision. And then, um, again, mobility is what's most important. Um, systematic reviews suggest that phrenotomy or phrenectomy, same, basically just uh, clipping that tissue um, for constriction 
to re you may see some benefit reducing maternal nipple pain and you may improve some breastfeeding success along, you know, ideally if the procedure is performed in conjunction with support of other allied health professionals. What I think we found alarming last year was a paper out of, uh, I believe, New Zealand where they actually did cataract dissection <clears throat> of lingual frenulum. And what we thought was just kind of dead fascial tissue that didn't have any innervation or muscle. In the majority of those infants, not only was their genioglossus muscle that had been pulled up into this fold of fascia, but the underlying lingual nerve branches were very superficial and would have been very easily injured during phrenotomy. So um, I have definitely seen my share of babies that go on feeding strike. Um, you'd never know this on the internet when moms talk about getting their baby's tongue clipped, it's like a miracle. Um, I do think both, most babies do feed immediately better in the office because of the stress of the procedure and the pain, but things fall apart when they get home. Potential harm is bleeding, pain, refusal to feed, weight loss, and then scarring or cyst formation. Um, there are lots of pros and cons about how the procedure is done with scissor, scalpel, or laser. Um, Everyone says, well, what about his speech? Okay, he's feeding fine, but maybe we should worry about speech. So this most recent paper from the International Journal of Otolaryngology basically said there's no difference between tongue mobility and speech outcomes in young children with or without intervention for tongue tie in infancy. Um, they recommend families not proceed with surgical intervention for the sole outcome of improving speech production later in life. This is the assessment tool, the uh, Hazel Baker tool that I use. Again, there are several others. I think this one for me, <clears throat> I actually print a copy of it and do it along with the family and send them home with it so that they too can sit there and play with um, appearance and function. Doing those oral motor exercises that we talked about earlier gives you the opportunity to look at lateralization when you are tracing their inner gum. Um, when you're watching them lift their tongue, um, trying to tickle their lips to see how, if they will extend the tongue, um, how much spread the tongue has, particularly when they cry, can they spread it out nicely? Does it cup and thin and lift? Um, you know, do the edges get very thin? And when they're doing a digital exam, can they feel that peristalsis on their finger? And do they ever feel like kind of a snap or a, um, a restriction? And then with the appearance, we look at, you know, is it round? Is it clefted? Um, how long is that frenulum? And dads, dads are great. They love, they, uh, they don't actually get out a ruler, but I'm like, well, do you think that's a centimeter? Oh, it's at least a centimeter. Good, it's nice and long. Um, where is it attached to the floor of the mouth? Where is it attached on the tongue? How elastic is it? And then um, just again, overall watching the whole assessment. So we'll, those oral motor exercises, same slide as earlier, just using those techniques to not only um, get the information, but or teach them to or just look at, um, again, if you're not touching the babies, the parents are actually able to do these things and show that their baby has good tongue mobility. <clears throat> a little digital assessment of the suck. Mom should, again, be able to feel a smooth, coordinated pattern. The tongue on the underside of the finger, not the lower gum ridge. They shouldn't feel biting, chomping, sliding, thrusting, chewing. And then a bottle feeding. Um, I mentioned the baby that the mom wanted to exclusively breastfeed, but at this point, she was exclusively pretty much bottle feeding formula. When I watched that baby formula feed, um, it was a disaster. Like he could not, and he was a term baby. I'm not really sure what was going on, but certainly could not even organize himself to attach to the nipple. He was losing suction. He was dribbling, drooling. Um, and she said sometimes he could do it really well and he was neat and not messy. And other times he was on off just making a mess. And so my suggestion there was um, I really wanted him to have a occupational therapy, speech therapy evaluation um, just in feeding skills. Because I, I think, you know, again, the tongue wasn't the issue. He had some other stuff going on that needed to be addressed. So my bottom line on tongue tie is we, can, we encourage a considered clinical approach that includes ruling out other potential causes of breastfeeding difficulties before proceeding to surgical event intervention. Most families are grateful for this. Um, they certainly come in wishing for a miracle cure that they're gonna walk out of the office better, but recognizing that their baby's tongue is actually pretty normal and there are other things that we can do with alignment is great. Um, and just assessing the full situation, I could go over and over different scenarios, but just the 
the layers of complication. It's a late preterm baby or their little large breasts, large nipple, pumping and storing, you know, most of the time the tongue needs to be looked at, but there's so many other fun issues to address that we can often fix. It's a really great situation. Um, again, providing encouragement and support skills will increase with time, patience, and persistence if the infant is thriving. Optimizing alignment, positioning, avoiding the pitfalls of a shallow latch and a flexed neck. Um, learning the, the facts about the, the dyad and being realist, realistic about what mom and baby can accomplish with feeding, pumping, supplementing. And certainly, I haven't mentioned it all, but looking for postpartum depression. Um, we're screening all of our moms in the lactation clinic and in our general pediatric practice using the Edinburgh. And so often, postpartum depression symptoms, whether are part of the breastfeeding problem or due to the breastfeeding problem, um, it's really uh, been a lot, certainly worse with COVID. So I really haven't mentioned formula much, but a necessity for many situations, but not all. I always say use it with intention, as little or as short a time as possible for a situation based on the family's goals. Helping the families realize that it is not even close to being as good as breast milk in quality, um, and that you know we love for them to provide breast milk for their families and we want them to be successful. Um, I always suggest, and we have taught our residents to review mixing with all families because we find that formula mixing is often not done properly. And um, oh, that's that last bullet is supposed to say, I ideally don't mix breast milk and formula so as we don't waste any breast milk. Um, there's some theoretical reasons why you shouldn't do it that maybe it precipitates out some of the good stuff, but <clears throat> I try not to mix them if we don't have to. We want them to finish all the breast milk first. Um, and then preventing overfeeding by the bottle, whether that's express breast milk or formula, we've realized that bottle fed babies certainly are more apt to take more volume because the feeder has control. So telling families, you know, reminding them not to overfill the bottle, definitely pace and allow the babies to have frequent pauses and opportunities to burp. Using a pacifier at the end of an appropriate feeding volume if we need to provide a little satiety and offering additional amounts if necessary in small increments and then other soothing techniques. And there you have it. It's going from good to great. Perfect. Lots of good that is, fun stuff. Thank you so much, Dr. Brunner. That is just perfect timing because you left us just a couple of minutes for questions. If anyone has a pressing question that they would like to um, ask, please raise your hand and I will unmute you. Catherine has already chatted in a few questions, so I'm going to unmute her. Well, let me see. Let's see. I'm going to unmute her now so she can pick her hottest. Huh. Yeah. Okay. So it doesn't seem like I'm able to unmute you, Catherine. I'm sorry. So I will read her question to you. Hey, Jerry. Um, yeah. Oh, there she is. Okay, great. It allowed, I it allowed me to unmute myself. Um, right. Have you Go ahead. My question is, have you noticed a correlation between moms with lots of inflammation, body overall body inflammation, and, and having oversupply? Um, I'm not sure I have a good answer for that. Um, I think it can go either way. Certainly moms who have illness for other reasons or things going on, I do think struggle with supply. Um, I'll have to, I'll be more attentive to that and see if I can come up with better info on that one. Okay. Thank you. I have. Yep. That's why I was asking. Because you okay. see much, what, much more, many more what, people than I do. What types of inflammation are they, like, underlying um, do they have? Uh, things, just overall puffiness. They might have cystic acne. They just... They they might they might have lupus. They might have all of these inflammatory response things. Um, yeah. I I see that very frequently. Okay, it like those. Like most, yeah, I mean, most of the moms we see are overall pretty healthy without a collection of um, of their own illnesses. But I mean, it's definitely. I mean, we definitely see with. Moms with type 2 diabetes, um, delayed on the milk production, we know that there is a prolactin receptor down regulation uh, when moms have insulin resistance. So that explains some of the low supply in um, those moms. But I'll be more attentive to other inflammatory conditions and see what I see. 
And may I ask one more question? Sure. Um, are are you also seeing an increase in tiny nipples regarding flange fittings, like 13 to 17 millimeter? I have not. I have definitely seen some smaller situations recently where we were, you know, talking about like what kind of pump is that and how small does the flange go? But I've I was just I'm, curious yeah. because I, I'm seeing an increase in the in um, uh, uh, cracks at the base of the nipple for moms that have smaller nipples and they're not appropriately sized. They're using a flange that's much too large mm -hmm. yeah. for their nipples. We ask moms to bring in all of their equipment to the in-person appointments and I do spend a good bit of time watching moms pump if that's part of their routine um, on telehealth but don't do a ton with pump parts and that stuff but that's interesting okay thank you dr Brunner. i cannot thank you enough um, for taking time out of your very busy schedule i have one question for you which is regarding your telehealth telehealth um, breast um, breastfeeding medicine practice uh, can Virginia Wick uh, begin to refer to, hello, there's a beautiful baby. Now we're up. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect timing again. Um, yeah. And I did have one question. Does formula feeding, in addition to breastfeeding, affect the chance of a baby to build a strong immunity? How would you answer that question, Dr. B? Yeah first part of the question again, does it help? It does formula feeding in addition to breastfeeding affect the chance of a baby building a strong uh, immune system? Gotcha. Well, okay, so I would always say more breast milk is better and that you're gonna build a stronger immune system just because, I mean, honestly, breast milk is teeming with bacteria. Um, regardless of, you know, I mean, obviously when we pasteurize it, we remove all the bacteria, but fresh milk for moms has all kinds of good, even, good bacteria in it to populate the gut, which is actually gonna help the immune system. So, I mean, from the perspective of, I guess, formula, it's gonna decrease the milk intake from the breast so that would decrease the benefit of the breast milk. I guess you could say formula, if it was contaminated in any way, might provide the baby another impetus to increase immunity to whatever was in there, but that's not a good idea. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I would say, you know, you gotta do what you gotta do. And if you can increase your breast milk volume and decrease the formula, then your immune system is likely gonna get a better boost. But if you need to use formula, the majority of people who are formula fed have robust immune systems as well. So I, I don't think you're, you're, you're just not optimizing it to the degree that you could. So how about referrals to your telemedicine, your telebreastfeeding medicine practice? Well, funny you should ask. Um, I was uh, on the, before we all met this morning, I was on the call that we are still working through the logistics of who will do our registration and scheduling. And we did not have any telehealth this week at all. Dr. Sri Raman's actually in the office with ENT today, and we have an ENT clinic next week. Um, but I will say, I was told by November 1st, we should have an ongoing plan um, for two in-person sessions a week and two telehealth sessions a week. Um, and I will check with Michelle Green. I mean, we're seeing all insurance. Um, uh, and I would say, I mean, there is a community benefits program through the Children's Hospital to see uninsured folks. It's not as straightforward as it would be nice that it could be. Um, but we have not had any difficulties um, seeing moms and babies and billing and collecting and providing the care for, there was just concern from the children's hospital if we could see adults and take care of adults and the moms. But my husband is sports medicine and he's proven for years that he can see any age and with no problem. So it's worked well. Awesome. So you, I will look forward to receiving um, updates on that and I will certainly share that um, with our uh, local agencies across the state because certain areas are really under-resourced when we need to refer outside of WIC for more expert assistance. So thank you again, Dr. Brenner. Thank you everyone uh, for joining us today. You will be receiving a survey link to complete in order to receive your continuing education credits and a certificate. Thank you so much for joining us today and have a safe 
and a lovely uh, weekend. Well, you know, I was about to put us on Friday. It's still Thursday, but we are off on Monday. So please enjoy your um, long weekend. And thank you for joining us today. And thanks again, Dr. Brenner. Thank you. Enjoy your day. Bye-bye.